Okay. Um, I think we'll start, and I'll um, hopefully I won't get too diverted by um, having to let people in. So, um, but uh, we were scheduled to start at ten, and it's one one minute past. So, hey, welcome. Um, I'm really excited. This um, uh, proposal started off from a very small um, uh, discussion among PhD students uh, at the University of Dundee to, to talk about publishing. But um, it, as they say in the modern language, it's kind of gone viral and I've had um, uh, 45 people um, sign up. So, uh, and that's terrific from a range of countries. We've got people from over 14 countries, which is um, extraordinary. Um, so uh, my name's Fiona Kamari Campbell. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a professor of disability and ableism studies at the University of Dundee. Um, so it's great to be here today. I am running this session in a private um, capacity um, and I will be recording it. So uh, you'll have an opportunity if I'm going too fast. Uh, you should have all been sent the PowerPoints. Um, I have, as usual with PowerPoints, added a few others after sending them to you. So um, uh, and um, so I can send the updates um, as we go. Um, if you could put your microphones on mute. Um, basically, what um, the the format that we're going to use is I'm going to um, give a, a presentation. Um, if you have any questions, just um, write them down. Um, don't put them in the chat box because it's a distraction because every time somebody puts a chat message up, it pops up. Um, uh, and then we'll open up to just just a discussion and fire away uh, with any any questions that you that you have, any clarifications. Uh, I hope you can understand my accent. Um, I, people have often said I talk too fast. I'll kind of keep it at a, a even pace. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen and hopefully you will see that. Share my screen. Okay, so I have to now put it on the slideshow. Let me just move this. So I've got a okay, slideshow in the beginning. Okay, now I just have to also admit somebody into the waiting room. Okay. So uh, my, these are my contact details. You've got that. I'm not going to spend much time on it um, because you've, you've been given the, the slides in advance. Um, so we'll move on to the next page when it decides to move. Let's have a look. Okay, next slide. Right. So I just put that up there, not so much as self-promotion. So um, I've, I am currently a member of a number of editorial uh, boards for journals, and um, I'm also been a member of six others in the past. Uh, when you're a member of an editorial board um, uh, or a reviewer, that's a time limited um, arrangement. So it's not something that goes on for the rest of your life. Um, it's usually, um, to ensure that there's a regular turnover um, of a variety of people who are um, on boards. So really, um, and, and again, there's a slide that gives you um, a range of my own research interests. Now, I've, I've put that up because there are some areas that um, I'm unfamiliar with in terms of uh, journals and research, but I think I've got a fairly broad uh, range of perspectives. So um, I hope, and I um, hope that, um, what I'm going to say today in the presentation with you um, speaks to your own interests. Um, I won't be able to cover everything. One area that I'm not covering today um, because of sheer time is uh, book, book proposals. Um, if that's of interest to you and we can discuss that in the q and I'm happy to uh, actually run a separate workshop on book proposals um, and some of the kind of issues around uh, what, what publishers do you approach? Uh, where, again, where do you want your readership to um, to be? But today, we really our focus is on um, is on is on journals. So I wanted to start off our discussion um, on a I guess a negative note or a cautionary note, but I think it's a really important note to start off with, and that is the issue of predatory predatory publishers. Okay, so I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with predatory publishers, but let's go and kind of go through this because 
um, this is an area I think of great a great concern and I've often found for example for uh, writers for for authors particularly in non-western countries um, or countries where um, uh, English is a second language um, uh, that these predatory publishers um, tend to pounce on people um, and this will be a theme throughout my presentation. I guess one of the challenges in international publishing, particularly if you don't come from the UK, don't come from North America, uh, don't come from Australia, is uh, trying to get your work out there in the international field. And um, one of the challenges and one of the barriers is this uh, kind of issue of what's called international relevance. And again, we're, as I said, we'll pick this up as we go along. I mean, actually, all research um, that's developed, uh, that's based on maybe a country study or on a specific, specific issue related to a country should be of international relevance. But in reality, uh, the major publishing houses, as you would be aware, and the major journals actually are run from uh, either the UK um, or, or the USA, okay? And in fact, um, that's where we start getting into problems because, uh, for example, an American publisher doesn't, an American author doesn't necessarily have to answer the question about is their work internationally relevant? Um, it's often assumed automatically to be to be the case, right? Whereas if someone's writing from uh, a Nepalese study, it's like, well, all that might be too specific, okay? So one of the responses often to that is uh, uh, people in desperation are scrambling to look at who will publish my work. And uh, that's where pre predatory publishers come into it. So as I said in the, in the PowerPoint slide, there isn't any one definition of what a predatory publisher is. They usually charge a fee for publication material. Now, I need to say to you that that doesn't mean that all journals that um, accept your article for publication and then ask you for a fee, it doesn't mean they're predatory, but you just need to check it out, right? Because um, it's, it's a complicated area, okay? Um, uh, actually, given that, let's be clear here, publishers are not in the business of necessarily promoting education or new new research or new knowledges they're in the business of making money um, I think we need to be really really clear about this and journal publishing is one of the most lucrative in the world I mean when you think of it uh, in no other industry do you get um, a situation where pretty much the publishers reap a hundred percent of the revenue earned from publications and authors uh, don't get royalties, okay? It's very rare. In fact, I've, it's, it's almost unheard of. I would say 99% of authors don't get royalties. So if you're, if you're interested in publishing your, your research to get rich, I would suggest that you might wanna think about writing romance novels um, or crime thrillers that might be far more lucrative. Um, the other thing with predatory publishers is usually they uh, they don't provide any of the backup that normal publishers uh, provide. Um, what what do I mean by backup? What I mean is uh, editorial uh, assistance, uh, proofreading. Most journals will uh, hire copy editors to uh, review your papers, um, and of course peer review, which we will discuss in more detail later right and when i say that most journals are higher copy editors that also is diminishing as they're trying to reduce cost savings usually what they do is they expect the um the author to to, to, to copy edit um or the journal editor i mean in fact the journal editors often uh, play a kind of a, a go-between role uh, you may have also, and maybe this is something again in the chat we can, uh, in the Q&A we can talk about it. Maybe you've already been sent one of those emails and you know, they're quite flattering, uh, those emails. Like we've come across your, you know, your exceptional manuscript. Um, we'd love to publish your work and that all looks really good, particularly if you've um, never had uh, um, a journal article published or never had a book. Uh, published, um, you think, wow, this is great. This publisher's, um, you know, coming to me, uh, wants to know more. Um, and then you click the button and start having having discussions, yeah? 
So one of the things um, about predatory publishers is, yes, you might get something published. It might be a, a, a article in a, a journal or it may be a book, uh, but the prices are really, really expensive. Now that's really important, okay? Because if it's really high prices, people aren't gonna buy it. The other thing I should say to you about predatory publishers other than standard publishers is a normal publisher like, for example, Routledge um, or Duke, um, you know, to name a few, uh, they have their own distribution networks. They have their own marketing, right? So one of the challenges is uh, to promote the journal, to promote the book, uh, and um, you know, through their own extensive networks. They also have agreements with, um, in the case of journals, uh, subscription packages with libraries, with licensing, all that sort of stuff, right? So again, um, like for example, there might be a journal that's in on your library database, um, the library has probably purchased that journal as part of a bundle, okay? Um, same, same with books as well. So predatory publishers generally do very little, almost zilch um, to uh, distribute and um, promote a book or promote a journal. Sometimes it's actually really hard to access the journal. Um, it's not open access. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, usually what happens if you're affiliated with a university, uh, you can um, click on the button when you found the journal, when you found the article, uh, and you can click on a button that links you to, to see whether your university is registered, you know, to, to access that. Otherwise there's a paywall, right? And some of these articles can cost up to 35 pounds uh, for the article. Uh, with these predatory publishers, however, uh, they are not linked to uh, global university affiliation databases, which means nobody can see the article. You can't get access to it. You're lucky if you get access to the, um, the abstract, yeah? And the final aspect about this is to check out the fine print on contracts. Now, this is the stuff that's really distressing um, folks. And this is the stuff where I've had, you know, people I've met in tears, to be honest, absolutely in tears. They've got their first book published. They're really excited. And um, they've, but then they've discovered, in fact, they can't use any of the material from the book elsewhere because actually what they've done without knowing is they've signed away all their authorship rights. You know, you're the creator of the work. They've signed over all their authorship rights to the publisher. It means that they're, 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 all their material is, is locked down. And I think particularly, if I may say, that particularly applies to, um, people who decide to use uh, predatory publishers for their PhD. Now, this is a, probably a bit hard to read, which is why I've sent it to you in advance. And as I said to you, I'm not principally talking about books, but this aspect of predatory publishers applies to, to books. So this is an amazing book. I, um, I don't know this person, so I've got no uh, vested interest in this. This is actually an amazing book I came across on Amazon. So predatory publishers do put their books on Amazon. Um, Medical Quackery in Sri Lanka. So it's a it's a it's a sociology book. It's about um, uh, the regulation of medicine and people who kind of go around and say that we can heal you and cure you and um, that sort of thing. Now, um, uh, it's it's it was published by and again you why I sent you the PA, uh, the powerpoints in advance it might not be clear so it's published by a very known predatory publisher right but it looks all official so it's um, uh, VDM Verlag I'm probably not saying it correctly because it's German okay uh, Dr Muller he comes up and actually there's a few companies under Dr Muller's name. Um, now, this comes from, just to give you the context of this, this is not necessarily an illegitimate enterprise, and I want to make this really clear. In Germany, from what I understand, is uh, actually part of the process of get, getting a doctorate is getting your doctorate officially published, right? So what's happened is that these publishing houses have um, arisen in response to, to this. Um, but what they do, and this is where it's different from a traditional book, you send them the PDF, right, of your of your PhD, you, um, and they will publish it as it is. Now we we could run, and I would like to run at some stage when we another workshop on book publishing, and maybe also looking at how do you convert a PhD to a book, right? Because actually, uh, 
uh, a published book is not the same as a PhD. Okay, PhDs are written in the style of a PhD. <laughs> it sounds really obvious, but the, and the requirements differ from you know university to university and place to place. Yeah, um, so actually, there's lots of uh, changes that need to be made, modifications and adaptions. Uh, but here you've got an example where the the uh, the PhD or the master's thesis, because actually they also publish master's dissertations. Yeah get published straight into print. Now that again might seem really attractive if you want to start out and get your word and get your uh, research out there. But as I said to you again, remember the, the control of copyright, yeah? But the other issue is it actually can be quite boring. Uh, you know, you would be surprised to know that actually journals and books, part of what makes them readable are things like layout, formatting, readability, you know? Uh, but what they do is they literally, so if, depending on how you've typed it up and the font that you've used, it all gets literally, it's literally like a published photocopy. So I hope that's really clear. If you, we can talk about that again in the Q&A um, later, but I just really want it because it's got deadly consequences. I mean, as I said to you, I've had people in tears. Uh, the, 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 the thought of that your, you know, your work, your, the, the, the work that you've put in over several years can be locked down for at least a decade. It's a nightmare. Uh, and that would also apply to journal articles because if you get your uh, research published in a journal, a reputable journal, actually journals, uh, um, publishers are quite reasonable. Uh, I'm currently negotiating with a publisher at the moment to have um, two articles that I previously had printed in a journal. Uh, be reproduced within a book, right? So, so it's uh, usually they're quite reasonable about that. But with predatory publishers, you might have problems. So let's uh, let's move on, and because uh, I have this habit of talking too much, and I've got a few slides to get through. So the questions that you need to know, like where do you, where do you start? So this is so what we're going to be talking about now is how do you find out about what journals are possible for you to publish in, right? And the first thing I want to say is sometimes people take a very narrow approach um, and they might only know about three or four journals. And one of the things that's probably really critical is just to look at the range of journals. There might be some journals that actually are better to publish in in terms of the readership. And again, we'll talk about that. Uh, but you might stand a greater chance. So for example, there are high impact journals and uh, uh, journals that have thousands of submissions, uh, they have high rejection rates, uh, the chances of you getting over the line are difficult because of the sheer numbers. Uh, the other thing is even if you do get acceptance into a journal because of the sheer numbers again, it may take some time. In other words, there may be some a backlog, yeah, a backlog in uh, getting these journals published. Um, the other thing I should say to you is that um, uh, what happens is that um, journals have usually, they have to state how often they publish and what months they publish an issue, yeah? But some journals actually uh, don't adhere to that because it's out of sync. So it's not unusual, for example, to find some journals. I wouldn't say it's common, but some journals may publish like a, uh, a 2018 issue in, in um, uh, 2020. Like seriously, it becomes a, a really big, big issue. So the questions you should ask is, do you or your colleagues know the journal? Like if it's a journal that you've, you've that's come up, that's that, that, that that's you, somebody, someone's you've seen somewhere, or maybe you've sent an email, do they know the journal? So always talk to other people, yeah? If you wanna see whether a journal's legitimate or not, you need to go through, go and look at their web page. Uh, can you find out um, how to contact them? Um, is there any information on uh, 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 on um, any affiliations? So, for example, some journals are um, uh, s sponsored by a professional association or society or private organisation. Now, if it's a private organisation, you, you need to do your homework, as will become clearer later in some of the slides. Sometimes a private organisation can have the name that it looks respectable, it looks okay, but actually it's, you know, it could be funded by some kind of far right white supremacist organisation. You don't know. And if you think I'm being a bit over the top, just wait until we talk about that. Yeah. The other issue is, um, 
do you recognise the editorial board? I mean, you should be doing this anyway, and, and this will become clearer as we move through. Have a look at who's on the editorial board. Are they familiar names? Uh, um, uh, are you familiar with their work? I, you know, I would also, again, and I didn't put this as a dot point because I was running out of room on the slide, but, you know, have a flick through the articles, get a sense of the kind of articles that are published in this journal. Uh, for example, are they uh, articles that um, encourage critique? Uh, are they articles that are kind of more, more traditional and, and positivist in, in focus? Uh, you, you will get a sense of that. Do they engage with methodological issues or theoretical issues? Okay. Some of the other questions, and I'll just go out, run through them. This is more for your information. And, and, and what's happening is um, in the field of journal publishing, probably in the last 20 years, uh, you know, the, 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 the companies involved have really tried to get rid of the, the rat bags, you know, the, the, the dubious publishers and have kind of implemented codes of ethics. So again, I've mentioned here the Committee on, the publica on Publication Ethics. Um, that's a great chart, actually, they, that site, because they have a number of charts which look at the flow chart of decision making with journals, um, uh, issues around peer reviewing, okay, issues around authorship, which we will cover later. Okay, so there's some links there in terms of um, access. It, there's no global system here. Um, again, I put some links down to. Uh, um, platforms for journals published in Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Central America, etc. And there's a separate um, database for um, African journals. Okay. Now, this is meant to work. And if it doesn't work, let's have a look. Oh, it is. Fiona, Professor yep. Fiona, yeah. but I cannot uh, see the video and I think that other ones also cannot do it that as well. I'm sorry about that. Oh, okay. No, thank you for telling me. Thank you for telling me. So you can't see the video, yeah? No, we cannot. We can hear really, I don't know, for me at least it's not. Okay. I put, I put the link up. I put the link up on the slide. So have a look at the, uh, the link. Thanks for telling me that and uh, great for intervening in, in that. So I'm going to um, start from the current slide. You can check the video, the links there. It's actually quite a good video. It's only two minutes, but it's a really good reminder to, to take you through that, yeah? So thanks, Camilla, for that. Okay, hopefully that screen, right. So, oh, I'm gonna turn that video off. Oh God, hang on. <laughs> I don't want that. Are you ready to publish? Okay. When in doubt, okay, I'm going to uh, talk about that. I'm um, right, okay, let me just move that around. Okay, so I'll, I'll get onto the next slide, but I'm, I'm going to get around this video starting. So some of the questions that you wanna look at is why do you want to publish? Now, this is, seems like a really obvious question, yeah? But actually, it's, it's, it's not that obvious. Are you there to uh, put out new work? Are you there to contribute to a debate? Um, are you wanting to kind of get social change happening around your work to find other people who are interested? Um, who do you want to read your work? Now, this is really important. Um, if, if, for example, that, uh, and particularly there's a number of you here from um, uh, non-UK countries, um, this is a really important issue. Uh, one of the things in, in my own uh, work is uh, in, in Sri Lanka has been trying to get Sri Lankan research uh, published globally, right? Because actually some of the things, the experiences and the research findings in Sri Lanka are relevant. They're relevant to other countries. Uh, they can be adapted. Uh, people need to know about uh, um, um, cross-country experiences, right? So if you want... Uh, 
people outside of let's say Sri Lanka or India to to read your work you really need to look at a um, international journal now that's and, and look there's a dilemma with this because as I said to you the international journals are run and controlled and owned by UK big multi-million dollar companies UK and USA so this is the dilemma but we do have the global politics of, of research production, right? And then also in English, this is another issue for those of you who English is a second language. It's a real dilemma. You can publish in your country's language in a, in a, um, a non-English speaking uh, journal, but uh, the fact is uh, whether, we, whether we like it or not, and I must say I don't like it, uh, that, that um, English is the dominant global uh, universal language. With, uh, with French and uh, Spanish coming up uh, uh, um, in, in the line, but at the moment it is very dominant. Uh, if you want uh, to be able to uh, get a, 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 bro a, a broader field of people to read your work and I guess hook into those networks because there are other advantages come, that come with publishing. One of the issues is that uh, you, there's credibility, there's uh, access to, to, to jobs, scholarships, uh, conference speaking, you know, you know all the, the sort of things that come out of that. Um, so I think it's really important about who you who do you want to read your work where okay so you can publish in an in-country journal and that's fine certainly what I recommend for some people is actually uh, is to publish both in-country and out-country right so and to, so to your two audiences the other uh, issue is if you're like an interdisciplinary uh, scholar like myself um, is we might have multiple readers. One of the questions I've put up in the slide is who are your community of scholars? What do I mean by that? Well, I do disability studies research. I, I do research around law, yeah? And I do research around different cultural understandings of disability. Now, obviously I want the disability studies people, people who are interested in disability to read my work, but I also want people who, um, are interested in human rights, who are interested in law reform, yeah, who are interested in cross-cultural research to read my work. So that will that will um, determine or impact upon my on my decision making around which journals to select um, in. So, for example, up until about well, I've been doing this now for nearly thirty years. That's a bit frightening, isn't it? But probably up until about ten years ago nearly all my disability studies research was published in non-disability journals, right? So um, now that's, it's a difficult one. I can't give you advice about which way to go. On one hand, if I'd spent my first two decades publishing in disability studies journals, um, I could have, uh, you know, built up a following. I could have contributed to the discussions in those areas, but at the same time, um, nobody outside of that bubble and disciplines are like a bubble. We're very, very close shop. Um, nobody else would have uh, necessarily read that work unless they were looking for me specifically and then they would, you know, do an author search. But what I was more interested in was actually educating and having debates with people outside of my area. So, for example, the law impacts on disabled people's lives. So I thought it was really important that I publish in law related journals, you know, or um, other kinds of journals to get the conversation going. This comes back to that first question about why do you want to publish? Well, I wanted to contribute to a debate. I wanted to get a conversation going, okay? And you might have uh, the, the question about, how, you know, who are, you, who are your community of scholars? You may have a diverse community and these communities may not necessarily uh, you know, talk to each other. It's slowly changing and we're now having uh, more interdisciplinary uh, journals. Uh, so where do you want to make an impact um, is another question. Um, so some of you are, depending on if you are with a university, and I know not all of you are, uh, some countries and some universities look at journal rankings or, or what's known as impact factors. Um, you need to check that out. Again, we can talk about that when we open up the discussion. Uh, I know when I was working and living in Australia, that was a really big issue and it was a very controversial issue. Uh, and 
if you're not familiar with this, what happens in countries that do this is they rank journals from, you know, one to a hundred and even longer, more numbers. Um, and so you've got top journals. Now, top journals aren't necessarily the best journals. They're usually ones that have got high impact rankings, you know, more they, they're publishing more, more people are reading them. Impact has also looked at the issue of citations. Okay, some academics are forced to each year produce a record of what's called a citation matrix. In other words, who cited their work, how many and where. Um, and, um, but the, the, the problem with that system is it often keeps privileging the same prestigious journals. Um, so I can say uh, more broadly, and this is being recorded, I guess, for example, you will find that in the top, top impact journals around the world, usually, usually and invariably come from the United States. You know, it comes from uh, the, 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 the US. Okay, so, um, and they're often the more conservative, pragmatic journals. Um, I will say they're probably the most boring journals. So the ones I've looked at in sociology, and I won't mention names, I sit there and think, oh my goodness, these journals are often quite tedious. Uh, but if, for example, that you, your work you think is uh, a new way of doing things, it's exciting, it's a bit different, it's a bit risky, um, you know, you might want to look at another journal that isn't necessarily highly ranked, you know. Um, now, in countries, for example, like the UK, um, certainly in my area, and we don't, we haven't gone down this line, uh, uh, thank goodness, right? So uh, it in theory, you can publish anywhere. Um, and um, with the UK, with our ref system, uh, the quality of the article is, uh, is ranked on its merits, uh, not necessarily uh, from the journal that, that it's in. Uh, but this is a, a really difficult kind of um, uh, area. But you need to kind of look at all those decisions um, around decision making. Now I'm going to um, put it back onto the screen. One of the terrible things, I don't know whether you've done this as presenters, is that you can't see people when you've got the PowerPoint slides up. So um, it's, uh, it's actually, um, I don't want that one, quite disconcerting. Oh, okay, we get back to this one. I thought we'd avoided that person. Now let me just get back into here. Okay, reviewing scope from current slide, thank you. This is where we don't panic. Okay, here we go. Right. So, one of the biggest mistakes uh, or errors that people make with and why the article gets rejected is actually, to be honest, it's in the wrong journal. Okay. And this is really hard. And as I said to you, I'm going to go through this with you. But, you know, when in doubt, talk to people. The more people you talk to, uh, um, to get advice on whether this is the best journal is us usually quite good. Although I would say don't talk to too many people because you'll end up confused. Uh, but you do need to assess the journal's statement of scope, right? And it's, it's usually called a scoping statement. We're going to put some slides up around that. And, that's, and, and so the problems are that there's a mismatch between what your manuscript um, is about and what the journal is meant to cover. Okay, so that will, it will, it will be rejected. And if it's not rejected out at, at, at first hand, what will happen is it will go out to reviewers. The reviewers will not be necessarily matched to the area that the topic of your manuscript and then you'll get rejected again, okay? So it is really, um, as I've said, the matter of scope's complex. There are statements. Um, I'm currently, um, putting together a publication which when it comes out I'm happy to send you. It's not going to be published but it's a list of uh, 80 journals um, that uh, basically uh, publish work that's around what we call uh, peripheral groups, marginal groups in the world, also more, more marginal and unusual methodological approaches and um, epistemological approaches. Right, so I've been sitting there studying these scopes uh, uh, day in, day out. It is complex. The, the, the journal will have a, what I mean by rhetorical statement, it'll be in print and it's usually some statement about like what they're into, what the journal's about, uh, what they feel strongly about. Um, but there are, other, there are other issues that you need to look at, which is why today's workshop's really great that uh, people don't tell you. There's, there's like a public life of a journal and then there's a private life of a journal. That's probably the best way to explain it. Um, so let's have a look at some of those issues. Okay, 
So one of the things that you need to look at when you're looking at the scope is have a look at who the editors are or editors in chief are and the boards, okay? Um, so who are these people running it? Sometimes you'll have a look at their affiliations, yeah? What universities they come from, what countries they come from. You may be able to find out also, as I mentioned earlier, is the journal sponsored by an organisation? So for example, uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 um, British uh, uh, Association of Sociology pr pr produces a journal called called Sociology. A number of journals are sponsored by professional associations. Uh, have a look at whether the journal covers a diversity of disciplines. Okay. Uh, have a look at. I, mean, I particularly look at the country of origin. It doesn't tell you everything. You can't just say just because someone's in the UK and the US they don't know about anything else. But have a look at it. Have a look at what the governance structure um, is. So I'll, again, that will become clearer. Uh, do, do you know anything about how they police content and perspectives? So I'm going to go, the next couple of slides are gonna um, unpack this a bit more. Okay. So let's, scoping the scope. So, you know, publishing journals has a history. Uh, journals are usually initiated by scholars who approach a publishing house and say, hey, we wanna publish this journal, okay? So you need to look at the history of journals in relation to um, other journals in your area. So for example, in the area of disability, there are probably about eight journals now around the globe. There's possibly a little bit more, um, but you need to look at, at, at like, you know, which ones were published first? Um, are they North American based? Are they UK based? Um, who are the people? Now this is really difficult because um, one of the things with journals is often uh, new journals emerge because they're not happy with an existing journal. Okay, so they're not happy with an existing journal. Can you still hear me? Yeah? Don't know if anyone can hear me at the moment. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. I just had yes. a note. I had a notice coming up saying my internet connection was yep. unstable. Okay, that's fine. I'll keep going. Yeah. So, Okay, so one of the things is, as I said to you, usually a new journal will emerge because they're unhappy with an existing journal, okay? That sometimes happens, okay? Another, it's not the only reason. Uh, you may get a journal that's very specific. So for example, uh, I think in the US, there's a, a, a journal on disability policy and practice, right? So it's specifically about policy and policy development. And, and it is unashamedly and fair enough, it's US focused, yeah? So uh, you will get a variety of journals, but it's what's really important is to have a look at. So, um, and I have to be careful what I say here because as I said, it's being recorded. So in the disability area, for example, you might get more traditional journals that are uncritical of the medical model, um, that um, are a bit more scientific, uh, may accept articles where, there's the scientific study of disabled people. So disabled people are kind of a bit like raw material and you've got the professionals. They may be about, you know, curing and fixing disabled people. So that gives you a sense of that camp, right? Then you might get another journal that might support what we call the social model of disability. So might look at the idea of disability being socially constructed, right? And you'll have a look at that because again, um, and this, I don't want this to sound so abstract, but for those of you, I know that many of you aren't in the disability area, but what happens with the development of a discipline is certain universities get more well known than others. So for example, in the UK, um, uh, Leeds University, Sheffield, um, Lancaster, they were the ones for the last, you know, 30 years that really have kind of kickstarted disability studies, right? So again, that's where you kind of look at um, the kind of theoretical issues. You, you're trying to read behind the scenes here about what's going on and and the um, the universities. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to make this as clear as possible. There are people, again, just using the disability field as an example, who don't like social constructionism and don't like the social model. They take different theoretical approaches and they have also set up their own journal or their own focus. So for example, as a journal of cultural and literary disability studies, that focuses on the humanities, it focuses on literature, you know, novels, 
and that sort of thing. So a very different fo focus. So you need to have, as I said, you need to have a look at that and, um, and because you don't want, for example, to uh, uh, submit a paper that is, for example, critical of a particular theoretical approach, um, it might get rejected. Look, and I know this is very sad news for you folk because probably you're thinking, well, isn't academia meant to encourage debate? Well, it is, but I think increasingly we are in a quite a, a toxic environment where there are limits to debate. So you need to have a look at that. As I said, uh, look at past articles. That's the best way to have a look at. Don't just look at one issue, have a look at, you know, um, uh, a range of, of articles, okay. Have a look at, uh, um, uh, you know, who's doing the writing, uh, the location of people, okay. Now I want to give you one example um, from my own situation and it just shows you, you're never too old, never too experienced to make mistakes with this. So as I said to you, I've predominantly not published in disability journals, but I had produced a manuscript looking at um, uh, concepts of shame within Buddhism, right? So, and um, uh, was looking at how uh, religious systems, the religious belief systems about disability might impact on the status of disabled people, right? So I submitted it to a disability journal, I won't mention which one, and it came back rejected. Um, I was devastated. No, I wasn't. I was shocked, but I, um, I haven't had a rejection in several years. But I had a look at that and I looked at the reviewers um, comments and what dawned on me uh, was that actually the reviewers didn't have the necessary expertise to be able to even assess whether the manuscript was reasonable or even a sense of whether it was important. Um, in that manuscript, I included lots and lots of Buddhist content. I explained it. Um, you know, uh, we don't, I didn't expect the reviewers or indeed the journal or indeed the readership, which is why I explained it, to know anything about Buddhism. Um, but uh, I think that was a deadly error in retrospect. Uh, it's a shame and maybe that might change over time that as, as journals increase their reviewing database and their expertise and have more people from the global south, you know, doing reviews, that might change. Um, instead, what I did in the end is I had to actually submit that manuscript to a Buddhist studies journal, uh, which is okay. It just meant that people doing Buddhist studies then maybe had to think about disability issues. So that's great. But what it meant that I th was that, um, that, you know, readership in the disability area um, didn't have the opportunity to consider that um, there were other approaches to disability. So I've just put up, these are really hard to read and um, some examples of, of, of scope. Disability in Society is an international studies journal providing a focus for debate about such issues as human rights, discrimination, definitions, policies and practice. And it goes on and on and on. And next to it is another journal uh, called An Antipodes, a radical journal of geography. Okay. Uh, it says it pushes geography's critical edge, intending, intending to engender the development of a new and better society. So there's a political statement. Many uh, are inspired by Marxist, socialist, anarchist, anti-racist, anti-colonial, feminist, queer, trans, green, and post-colonial thought. It's got everything in. Uh, they do welcome the infusion of new ideas and shaking up old positions through dialogue and discussion. They've said they're never committed to just one view of critique. So again, that's a good sign. If you've, if you've got something that's really out of the box, um, uh, you know, it, that might be a journal that you might want to have a look at, right? So these just are just examples. But here's an example, and I'm going to just very selectively, I, can you actually see the names on there? They might be small, but can you see the names? Yes. Oh, brilliant. Thank you yes. for saying that. Thank you. So this is Disability in Society. And I want to show you an example and we'll, um, I'll keep moving through because I'm mindful of time here. Um, so this is how you'll find each journal is set up very differently. Okay. So with Disability in Society, which is a, which is a top uh, disability journal, um, they've got an interesting structure. So they've got an editor, right? And they've got a consulting editor. Um, and, and then they have a editorial team, right? They've called them executive editors and you'll see my name 
on that. I've just joined them. Um, and that's a small executive group that makes the, the decisions, right? Then they have um, a two other categories and you'll just notice that one's called editors and the other one's called, if it, on the second slide next to it, occasional editors. And you might be thinking, what's an occasional editor? What's the difference between the two of them? And actually, I didn't know what the difference was until I got involved in doing this myself. Um, so uh, firstly, uh, we, we, and again, I'll point this out in the slides later, the, uh, um, this journal, basically every name on the list, and um, I've only got some of them there, all those people are reviewers, okay? So they're not just people um, put on a journal list to look good, right? They are, all those people are reviewers. Occasional editors are ones that um, don't do as many reviews and the editors are ones that uh, are tried and tested. In other words, as uh, part of the standard and quality control and then they uh, also do reviews, okay? So there's quite a different system there. Again, uh, you know, outside of this, um, your homework for doing this is go and look at some journals and study the range of backgrounds. Uh, you, you'll see, in fact, um, I mean, this journal's actually got quite a diversity of backgrounds, but it's still very much uh, UK, um, US, although increasingly uh, um, they have actually made some um, efforts to have people um, from other countries. Okay, so I've just put this one up. This is a journal uh, called Journal, it's, it's called Space and Culture India. Okay, so it's quite clear it's about India. But have a look at this one. This is fascinating. I, I, I don't know anything about this journal, but when I was researching for this, I went, wow. Okay, so it is published by Wiley. So that's a big international publisher. So that's one tick there if you want to get your stuff like, you know, published more broadly. But it's, it's about, it says it's, uh, it's um, published for times a year, uh, but it, its focus is on India. But have a look at the editorial group. This is fascinating. So remember, it's a journal about India. Um, now, I, I, you, we need to be careful here because just because someone has a non-Indian surname doesn't mean they're not Indian. I mean, you take me, for example. I've got a strange name. Um, but I'm actually from a Sri Lankan and a Scottish background. So we just need to be careful about rushing to judgment here. Okay. But we've got Marion Werner, who's from um, the USA, right? Handling editor. Looks like an Indian name. USA. Uh, USA. Glasgow. London. Again. Um, Germany. Managing editor. UK. So we've got, uh, so this, so, so the power of it in this journal is actually not in India. And it looks like it's not necessarily um, people who we would might see as identifying as Indians or from an in Indian heritage in the in the majority. Okay, um, their international advisory board. Again, I've only given you a snippet there. Uh, it's you need to have global advisory board, but I don't necessarily see any king hitters from India. Right. The other thing about this journal, and again, I don't know about this journal, so I'm not kind of, I haven't got any hidden agenda with this at all. It is actually published by a, an organization that I know nothing about, the uh, Alliance for Community Capacity Building in Northeast India. Interestingly, it's a UK charity. It's interesting. Uh, it operates in association with the Prague Foundation for Capacity Building. Okay, so these are the things that you have to check out, right? You have to check this sort of stuff out to find out more. And definitely if that's a journal that interest in publishing, yes, it's in an international publishing house. Have a look at the kind of articles and where they come from. Okay, so um, this is uh, uh, the editorial team. I've just sort of, uh, yes, I looked at the board here. So here we go again, editors in chief. There are um, Indian names here, but um, actually the two people are not based in India, they're based in the UK. Now, you might think, well, that doesn't matter, you know, uh, but there are debates, can I say to you, and they're quite nasty debates about uh, expatriates uh, holding the purse strings, holding the power. Uh, you will only know that from your own uh, situation. Um, some of these debates are fair, some of them are very unfair. Uh, I mean, you know, I've heard people, certainly in Sri Lanka, and we're very um, active on this, <laughs> debates about, you know, you know, what right does somebody who's um, been living in the US for 40 years, um, you know, have the right to, uh, to know about Sri Lankan perspectives, you know, these are big question, question, question marks, yeah, it's, uh, and um, 
uh, do and do do they put does the person need to be in? I mean, the fact is that the jobs um, uh, are often available out country. Uh, people often are forced to leave their countries for political reasons. Uh, so it's a really complex area, but you just need to have a look at it. Who owns the journal? And again, look at this editorial board. I'm actually flabbergasted by this. Um, it's got a mixture, but you just need to check, just check the names. Um, and check the names and check the politics because I don't know any of these people here, but if you also want to get a sense of what the journal's really about, I would kind of click on the links of a couple of these people, find out what their politics is. Um, and I'm just going to throw it out there because um, nobody can actually throw a link back at me because it's virtual. But for example, if it's an Indian journal, I'd want to check out their caste politics. Yeah, because is something cut like caste, for example, talked about in a kind of critical way, in an exploratory way, or is it an, an off limits for discussion? You just need to check that out. Okay, I need to keep moving through really quickly here because I'm a bit a little bit behind. I just wanted to also give some examples of um, how the public face might be different from what happens in reality. Um, the links there. So Hypatia is a really high powered journal. If you um, get something published in Hypatia, which is a journal of feminist philosophy, um, you've hit the big time. Um, I've never had anything published in there by the way, but I've never submitted anything to that journal. Um, but it is like a really big high powered journal. It says it's the forum for cutting edge work in feminist philosophy. Now, if I read that, I would think, well, you know, they're really into exploration, they're into taking risks, uh, they're interested in stuff that's a little bit edgy, that's controversial. But um, in fact, there's been a number of disputes in recent years over the removal of papers. What we're actually seeing increasingly is, and this is very, very sad, you know, I feel, oh, I feel really distressed about this folks because what's happening is I, academia is the place for intellectual debate and freedom and discovery and learning about ideas from people that you disagree with. Um, I mean, that's how knowledge develops and grows, yeah? Uh, but what's increasingly happening is um, if people don't like papers that have been published or find them offensive, is what happens is usually there's long letters and petitions to get that article retracted or removed from the journal, okay? And uh, that's um, a difficult issue. Uh, that happened with Hypatia. You can, I very rarely use Wikipedia as a link. Those of you who know me know that, but that gives you uh, an example of the Tuval affair where um, an article was published about transracialism and it was removed, but also actually people resigned from the board and there's new people and all this sort of thing. So you can, um, you can, you can check that out. Okay. Again, mindful of time, I, I, I'm, I'm going to spend another 10 minutes on this presentation, so I hope I get through all this and then we'll open it up. I do want to do this. This is, <laughs> I am creating mischief, but this is my moral responsibility. Be careful, not all journals, um, not all journals appear to be what they claim. So, um, you know, Sometimes, I remember I talked to you about the fact that sometimes new journals form because they're not happy with other journals. Um, this, and that's okay, that's the development of, of, of journals, right? But sometimes what happens is some people um, find that they can't get their work published in respectable peer-reviewed peer -reviewed journals because their work is so substandard, um, a poor use of data collection. Uh, their, 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 their conclusions are so over the top and offensive that they, they, they will not get published. And what they do, often do, and in this case, is they've set up their own journal, right? Because they're locked out of the mainstream. So this is a journal called Man, Mankind Quarterly. It's been running since the 1930s. It's basically a white supremacist journal. Um, it's pro-eugenics. It's a journal that, um, it says it publishes controversial areas, including behavioral race differences and the importance of mental ability for individual outcomes and group differences. Um, basically to cut a long story short, and you can look them up online anyway, they are the eugenics people. They believe that, um, actually they believe that East Asians are more intelligent than, than white people. Uh, white people are more intelligent than uh, than than, than uh, people from Africa. 
Um, and so it's that sliding scale of human intelligence. Uh, their recent issue put out a ghastly, ghastly, ghastly article on COVID-19 in the UK and argued that not only were higher um, uh, uh, black and Asian minority people who died from COVID, you'd be aware of this. It wasn't just because of socio-economic uh, conditions, it was due to diff different uh, differences and lower intelligence. And this was just published uh, this month. I think what I just wanted to point out to you here, which was the surprise to me was, um, it's, it, I said it's a white supremacist journal, but actually it's not as simply that. You need to look at this and, and this would make an interesting subject. Um, there, there's a number uh, of Chinese scholars that come on board, Saudi Arabia, Russia, uh, Serbia. Um, so all I'm just going to put it out there, uh, countries which may be interested in the idea of their, their people being uh, special people, nationalism, some of those kinds of issues. Uh, you just need to have a look at that, this whole kind of right wing tendency. Um, but yep, have a look at that. Um, okay, so let me just, uh, so I'm going to go for another 10 minutes and then we'll move it through. I mean, really, if I was, if I I will stop because I want to make open it up for people. Uh, word limit, have a look at it. That's the other big thing. Don't even go to a journal. If you want to write an 8,000 word paper and they won't, they won't only, only accept 5,000, forget it. You, uh, you need to just look at footnotes, endnotes, are they included? I must say increasingly the uh, word limit is seems to be on the re re reduced side. Um, have a look at that. Have a look at whether they include footnotes um, and endnotes. That's a simple slide. Okay, I've put some stuff around authorship here because this is, and, and, and because you've got the slides in advance, I think it's really clear. I just want to talk to you about, not so much going through all these notes, but talk about what some of the issues are. Okay, the first thing I wanna say is, uh, uh, is, is if, if you are a research assistant um, or a PhD student, um, or indeed an independent researcher, please be careful about, uh, how you circulate your work. Work does, it. You know, this is a terrible thing, work gets stolen. I've had my work plagiarized. It's bloody awful. Uh, it's, it's sad, it's unethical. Uh, particularly for research assistants, you, if you are contracted to do a project, before you start it, you need to find out. So I jump to that second last dot. You need to find out, uh, do you have authorship's rights to any of the publications? You know, If you're doing a lot of the writing, the majority of the research development, you should, you should be able to put a case to have your name listed as an author. I know this is really hard because there are uh, big power imbalances. You might feel intimidated and fearful to even have that discussion. You know, try and get an advocate if that's a case to, to, to help support your case. Uh, I have seen over the years scandalous situations where basically the research assistants have done all the research, done all the writing, write down, they've even submitted the jolly manuscript to a journal and they've not get being given credit um, or authorship for anything. And I'm sad to say, even as a, a professor myself, I've seen situations where professors um, often, because they're very busy um, and are not reading the latest material necessarily, or um, maybe they're not even doing as much writing because they're busy, um, um, have uh, claimed first authorship state, status, even if they've just had, have had limited input. You know, they may have written a paragraph or corrected your grammar or whatever. Uh, you know, I, it, it is sad. And um, again, it's that issue of rank. Um, I think we've I think we've improved now. I think students are far more, particularly PhD students. Um, and I think there's a, a, a better culture. But if you work in an environment where it's really difficult, where, you know, a professor gets to tell you what to do and there's no kind of um, uh, possibility for engagement, but you just need to check this out. Uh, in research teams, get some agreement from the order of groups of the group. Um, sometimes what happens in several publications, um, you know, people alternate the order, right? Um, the other thing is sometimes order doesn't matter as much these days. I'm going on to the next slide here. Um, is that um, actually? No, I'll go back because that's changes in authorship. I was going to say often what these days when you're submitting a joint article, most journals now ask you to indicate the percentage of contribution. Yeah, so you need to get some agreement about that. So actually it doesn't really matter about the order uh, because if you're all down as like, you know, 50% or 25 or whatever it is, depending on how many people, um, some people get their bee in the bonnet, they get kind of niggly about, you know, whether they're first author. I personally 
it's, it's not particularly bothered me, but um, you know, you just need to kind of um, have a look at that. Um, I won't go through the four criteria. I think the four criteria, you've got the PowerPoints, it's really clear. But if you have any questions after having read them, um, you know, because you've got the PowerPoints advanced, let me know. Again, I just wanted to quickly go through this slide just to let you know what this is about. You've had a chance to read it. Why might there be changes in authorship? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, you, what might happen is that you might be writing a paper with one other person or maybe another. And um, and depending on how the writing process goes, you might be kind of contributing bits and pieces, right? And um, uh, and you only see the final, you may have been in a situation where you only see the final manuscript, yeah? But you're not, um, you're not happy with it. Maybe actually uh, you've nominated a person in your group to submit the manuscript, right? And then um, after it's, it's been published, you've had a rude shock because you thought, hang on a minute, that's not the article that we all agreed to be published. The, the person we asked to submit it um, has changed things, you know? Added, they may have added references, but they may have changed some argument. Um, and, uh, and and they've changed things in such a way that you think, hang on a minute, I actually don't agree with this article. I don't want my name associated with this article. Uh, that's when uh, uh, there, there is a process for uh, negotiating uh, either your name to be changed, okay? And as it says here, again, I'm not going through all these, uh, if you want the a change of authorship prior to publication, everybody has to agree. Now, why is that important? Because I've seen very unscrupulous, I mean, this is nasty stuff, right? This is the down and dirty of academic processes. I've seen stuff where, uh, you know, a, a person um, who's, who's taking the lead in writing the article has had a fight with somebody else. And you know what they've done? They just removed their name. They haven't told them. I mean, how horrible is that? How unethical is that? So that's why these journals have come back. These journals have had to try and, over the years, resolve disputes in this area. Um, but uh, they've now introduced rules, and this is Taylor and Francis, but most journals do this, that everybody has to agree to the addition or removal um, before it goes in. Um, and as I said to you, there's quite a process um, after publication. But so, so I think there's some good mechanisms in place. The important bit is that you're familiar with them. And given that I've now included them in the slide, um, you are familiar with them. Okay, another five minutes. Peer review is really absolutely important. Uh, you, you need a statement. Now, this is something, again, when I was working in Sri Lanka, I really had to explain it. Peer review is not necessarily a concept that's understood or indeed embraced in many countries, right? If you have connections with homegrown journals, seriously, you need to uh, encourage them to implement a peer review process. It ensures peer review at the end of the day, firstly ensures that the, the work is um, been assessed by a community of scholars, yeah? It ensures that there's no patronage and favoritism Okay, and that sometimes happens in many other countries that somebody's not picked because they're a cousin of a cousin of a cousin. Okay, but it ensures rigor, rigor of the research, so it's quality. Yeah. Um, so usually it's uh, uh, anonymous peer reviewing. I don't like using the word blind peer reviewing because it's um, a, an, an ableist concept, but it's basically the idea that you have anonymous interviewing, uh, so reviewing. Um, where the reviewer and the author um, don't know each other. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and um, I'll just go on to the next slide because we've got the types here. Uh, so, so, and uh, so I should say that even though it's anonymous, sometimes the journals often give the reviewer. They ask, "Would you like your identity to be entity to be known to the to the author?" Um, I certainly say yes. That's fine. Um, uh, but let's have a look at let's have a look at that really quickly. Um, right. So there's two approaches, and I just again you've seen the slides. I just really want to nail this down because this may be confusing, right? So as I used the example earlier with disability in society, uh, all the people on the various advisory boards and committees, and they call themselves different things. The first approach is that the reviews are done in-house, they're undertaken in-house. So you see the names of the reviewers. You don't necessarily know who's reviewing your work, but at least you know the range. So, um, and in many ways, uh, that's a quite a convenient system uh, because uh, it means the journal doesn't have to rush around and find um, uh, 
uh, reviewers. It's actually really hard to get reviewers. Uh, reviewing is demanding and you can't overuse people, particularly if their uh, expertise is in an obscure area. Um, so this is often the approach. The other approach is on dot point two is to farm out the reviewing process. And I would encourage you, um, if you would like to be a reviewer, um, and uh, I think it's a great, it's, it's a good skill, it's a good thing to put on your CV. You learn to read other people's work, you learn about the submission process, is to contact a journal and find out. Uh, in, in the second version, people, the journal will farm out the reviews. They will have a database, Excel spreadsheet, um, uh, which has names, contact lists and knowledge areas, okay? But there can be gaps and I think that's uh, the problem. And as I said to you, the whole issue about um, having people, uh, having the list up to date. Uh, very quickly on this slide, if you, if uh, as I've said in the slide, if there's somebody you uh, don't want to review your work, you can actually put in a request. So for example, with that Buddhism and disability paper I mentioned, um, there is uh, somebody who works in that area who um, I've had a falling out with and um, I didn't want them to, to review my work because I didn't think it might necessarily be a fair review and I just put that name in, right? So there might be somebody that you, for a whole range of reasons, you don't want them to uh, review your work. So you can um, request that. So I'm gonna spend another, I said five minutes or so on this and then get through because I am really rushing and I'm sorry about that, but I hope it's been useful. Uh, so the, there are challenges of interdisciplinarity. This comes back to our question about where do I publish, right? What happens if you cover uh, a range of areas, right? Um, so that's a challenge because, you know, traditionally in universities, we've got disciplines with clear boundaries, yeah? There's lots of policing around that, but there are people who do work across disciplines. I've given the link there for interdisciplinary research. It talks about well, what's the definition. Actually, there's no agreed definition of what interdisciplinarity means, um, but generally it's kind of cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. Um, my suggestion for you, if you are an early career researcher, is to is the aim is for you to get known, yeah, to get your work to have some influence, and that you. Um, you, you um, spread your wings a bit further, you know, maybe a couple, this is one or two, it's actually maybe three or four areas of research um, that you spread your research across a range of fields and areas, okay? Um, often as your academic career develops, um, you are faced with the decision, which sometimes is quite tough to, to narrow down and say, okay, what are the, what are the, am I, am I, is my research mainly gonna be in one area or is it gonna be, in two, but you can't spread as broadly you, at some stage, usually about after six or seven years. Um, you know, don't, don't take that as, as literal, but at some stage you have to make that decision. There are challenges for multi-readership re research. Again, and for example, I've mentioned this to you before, if I'm writing something on disability and law, um, I, wanna, I want my law people to hear about it, I want my disability people in the, Younger days, I used to get uh, a, the same article published twice. Now, before people scream, um, and that's often sometimes what people will say, oh, but you're getting two for one. That's a duplicate publication. It's the same publication. No, it's not. I mean, it could be if you don't look at it, but actually you have to, ch you have to change. For example, in the law publications, I have to have a far more extensive discussion of disability. And in the uh, disability publications, I need a far more extensive discussion. I have to talk about legal systems, basic concepts, you know, so that actually they're not identical. And I think as long as you're checking that, I think it is ethically sound, but you just need to be keeping in mind, is this a duplicate publication? Um, but I think, you know, I think it's really important to, if, if you've got uh, two forms of readership there that you um, get the opportunity to spread it out. Uh, um, the other issue, and I mentioned this at the start, is one of the challenges is getting obscure obscure topics uh, published, particularly if you're outside of the uh, US or, 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 or the UK, um, and that idea of international relevance. So let me talk about in the couple of minutes that I'm gonna go through, and I really would have liked to have spent more time on this, if you can just bear with me. Um, okay, let's just run through it. Proofreading, obvious check the English that's used, check the uh, 
journal requirements. Don't argue with them, right? I had to write stuff in a Canadian syntax that drove me nuts. Like if I wanted to get something, uh, you know, published in Canada, you have to do it, okay? The other common mistakes is uh, um, people aren't critical enough. When you're looking at previous research, you need to assess that. Is that re are the research claims, are they poor? Is it bad research? And this, uh, what about the research design? And this can particularly be a problem, for example, if you are, uh, you know, in a global south country, and I don't want to do this kind of generalized claim, but sometimes the training, uh, the rigor around criticality um, needs to be improved, right? So there's not enough analysis. Or maybe you think the conclusions that in previous research, um, uh, they're, 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 they're um, confusing uh, correlation with causation, for example, okay? The other idea is uh, the captive mind, and I'm not gonna, I, I have got it on the next slide, but I'm, it's there, you can see it, is uh, I think one of the things when you're, particularly for those of you who are um, not from the UK or the US, is basically your, you, all your argument and all your literature is based on uh, Western sources, um, and that's okay, but if you're relying on Western sources and Western concepts, I think that's uh, really dangerous. So for example, the thing that I often as a reviewer ping people on are uh, different concepts of family, family kin relations, different ideas of self, individualism, yeah? Uh, different ideas of time. Uh, uh, they don't culturally make sense. And yet the research that you're using to bring into your study is actually based on a different cultural system. The other area, and I said I'm going through this quickly, I called it regurgitating the canon. Let me give you three areas that this often comes up, and yes, it is stilted towards my research. But for example, there's a concept um, within Sri Lanka called Protestant Buddhism. Uh, it was uh, developed in 1958 by a scholar by the name of Obasekara. Uh, it's, 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 I won't go into what the concept's about, but actually what happens is that people keep copying this concept. They keep naming it. They keep saying, oh yes, during this time in history, um, there was a Protestant form of Buddhism. You know, um, um, uh, you need to critique these concepts just because one person said it. Does the concept stand the test of time? The other area, for example, is sex gender concepts. Now I'm not going to open up a can of worms here, but for example, uh, you often hear in research around the idea of the third sex, you know, it, it, is that understanding in the country the same of the third sex, the same, for example, of how trans uh, genderism in the West is understood. Okay, so you've got to be very careful about mixing concepts up. The other final one is absolute bugbear of mine without critique. So many people write without substantiation. Uh, that, you know, uh, uh, Buddhist countries, Hindu countries, African countries believe in sin and karma and believe that, you know, dis disability was caused by, you know, sinning in a previous life. Um, show me the evidence. You know, we, we say this enough. The problem about regurgitating this stuff, if you say a narrative enough, it looks like it's truth. Actually, the area of sin and karma and beliefs about disability is one of the most under-researched areas, okay? So I've talked about the big mistake of taking Western research into non-Western concepts. Let me give you an example, okay? So that'll cover a couple of those dot points there. I recently reviewed an article about young people in Ghana, sex education, okay, that's all I'll tell you. Most of the literature about young people and sex education that was brought into this article was from the United States. And basically they assumed that young people's views about sex um, were in the United States were the same as what young people's views about sex were in Ghana, right? So that's big mistake number one, no. Then, uh, and look, if there's limited research about this on Ghana, say it, you know, have a look at the research. Then what they did is they, the authors did, um, and remember, I don't know who the authors are. They then went on to, uh, oh, let's pick another African country then. So then I think they looked at Nigeria and, um, and Zimbabwe. No, there might be some common threads, but again, Nigeria and Zimbabwe have different colonial histories, different cultural histories, different religious traditions. Okay, so you've got to be careful. The final thing I want to say about this before I um, uh, pretty much wrap it up is to say, uh, in, you'd be surprised, seriously folks, uh, people make statements without substantiation. You need to back up, you need to 
find some, whether it be another author, a report, some evidence based, otherwise it's just opinion. But I, I often find that, uh, you know, there's quite a lot of submissions that come into journals where uh, opinion masquerades um, as, as research. So I think, I think that's actually, oh, that's a captive mind. And I said, yeah, I've just put up a link there for retraction. On, it's not on the slide, you've got retraction watch. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, stop sharing so I can see you because this is awful. Oh, thank goodness. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I haven't been able to see you up until now. Um, but um, yeah, what I'll do actually is um, I'm going to, uh, let me just do the link here. I'm going to put in the um, in the chat. Okay, chat. I'm just going to put this link up here for you. Just you might just want to copy it now while you don't read it. Uh, but it's a really interesting um, article on a uh, recently published piece on police killings and why the authors actually removed the piece. But retractions watch uh, watches um worth looking at because you can look at all the dodgy papers that have been removed. Okay, let's open up for questions. So um, feel free to ask me anything. And I know that was really rushed. Um, well, hopefully that's been useful, but yeah, happy to take any questions. Let's go for it. Um, uh, just uh, I'll, I'll put up your hand and I'll just say work out a pecking order. Any questions? Don't be afraid. Yes, Padmini. Hi, Dr. Campbell. Hi, good on I you. Hope Great I to can, meet you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I'm not turning on my video because I have a uh, poor internet connection. That's okay. I should have said and, that at the start. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And I I wanted to email you, but I uh, about three weeks ago, I'd ordered, your, I'd ordered a book uh, edited by uh, Dr. Guy in which you have a chapter. On, yes, yes uh, I know that book. Yep. So that is the reason why I signed up for the uh, the webinar, and I think this is by far the most uh, honest and authentic conversation within the space of uh, trying to publish. Yeah. And I'm a doctoral candidate, so my question it is around the politics of how graduate students can navigate the publication spaces, and I is it is there a time within your PhD education where I'm I'm just trying to frame my question to be simple. Should I need my professor to approve if I want to independently research and write okay, a paper about you. my country? Yeah, I get you. Okay, a couple of things that you've said. Firstly, that book, just as an interest, I'm not flogging the book. I'm actually going to flog the publisher. So it was published by Sage India. And these are the dilemmas. Mm -hmm. These are the dilemmas because Sage is an international publishing company, right? Uh, yes. So they will publish... Um, uh, it, they will Sage India is a uh, what do you call it a kind of like a, a branch that's that's not the right word but you get it. Um, so what uh, what's good about that is they will they will publish stuff that's uh, related to the uh, Indian subcontinent and and the good news and this is what you need to think about too because is because it's published in India um, the book is cheaper right it's on it's on cheaper paper um, it's not as uh, polished and and that's really important because actually if for example the and this comes back to who are your readership. If you want people in your country to be able to read uh, materials, and this is for everybody here, sometimes you're forced to look at um, a, a, a regional publishing house, yeah, because yes. because um uh, because these uh because most of the books are too expensive. Now we know that there's piracy. Yes. We know that there are Facebook groups um that people oh, can get access to copies. This of book is expensive too. I bought. I know. I know. They sold me the one that had that has been marketed elsewhere too. So this was. If if I was not uh, if I didn't have my parents pay for this, I wouldn't be able to buy yeah. the book. Oh, look at it, it is, and it is yeah. really expensive. And again, because this is being recorded, I'm kind of restricted in what I can say. But I I, <laughs> cert I, I certainly know, for example, when I was working um, in Sri Lanka at a university, I mean, we used to go to a copy shop and. Um, uh, do bulk copies of textbooks. Yeah, so yes. I'm just going to leave it at that. Getting on to your other question. Um, actually, you know, this is a difficult thing because it's about custom and tradition as well. Actually, firstly, at the, at the most basic level, actually, you don't have to ask permission of anybody to, to publish your work. Let's make this really clear. You're an adult. 
Um, <laughs> but, you know, and I'm just saying this because we've got a very broad audience here. But, you know, sometimes uh, it's interesting. It, it's complicated because sometimes people do PhD projects um, particularly in the sciences more so than more more so than the social sciences where they're hired to do a PhD as part of a research team right so they've got a yes. couple of students and they're doing a project together um, mm -hmm. but again that's again the discussions about ownership of the work and and the data and publishing issues I would be clarifying this at the outset so for example if the professors who put in the grant um, you know, and then got the studentships, it may be more complicated. If you're not in that situation where, you know, you've applied for a scholarship or you've, you're fee paying yourself um, and you're, you know, you're doing an independent mm -hmm. PhD, you actually shouldn't need to ask opinion. Having said that, I mean, one of the things is this is PhD programs are of mixed quality. Not all, not all PhD students are having conversations about what happens after the PhD, about career pathways and choices. You know, mm -hmm. should I become an academic? Should I do postdoctoral? Uh, but these conversations are hit and miss and often depend actually on the supervisor or the PhD training program. So things about publishing, for example, um, this is an opportunity if you are doing a PhD to go back to your home institution and say, hey, can we have a local workshop on publishing? Um, we, in our school, it's, uh, it's on hold at the moment because of COVID, we have what's called a publication syndicate where um, anybody, and um, I know Dashani's here today, she's done this, um, uh, where people can submit drafts. People look at the drafts, people from all sorts of disciplines, so people from uh, other disciplines, you know, with different backgrounds, people see different di different issues because they mm -hmm. come from a different discipline. They review the manuscript, they give the feedback to strengthen the draft, and that's called a publication syndicate. If you write to me, I can give you a handout on that. So I think it's about finding ways to um, to, to 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 explore the issue of publishing. So anyway, if you want to follow that up, that's that's great. Any other uh, thank you questions? Oh, hi, Fiona. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay. Uh, thank you for this seminar. Um, I would like to ask quickly about your opinions on the preprint, please. So do you think that we should uh, go for the preprint or just don't bother and go straight for the peer review journal? Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, preprint, um, there's two different ways that preprints um organized sometimes preprint and this is the problem about some of these terms sometimes preprint is like an advanced um, issue because uh, some journals now in terms of their competitiveness it's about getting the stuff out quickly so for example if you're writing about COVID at the moment you don't want that published in a year's time because there's a backlog yeah you want it published now um, I think uh, it really depends, to be honest, it really depends on the topic. I would, again, come back to the question about what, to check out what, what, uh, what's, um, what's mentioned by preprint. Okay, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Um, what, I mean, what journals tend to do anyway, even if it's not a preprint, they will often give you, particularly the big publishing houses, uh, um, early release so they will set a oh, we'll publish it early and they will give you a link address and say hey you can send 50 copies of this article actually it's usually for free to people that you know so um, sometimes they encourage that as well um, somebody asked me about um, impact factor okay this is a really complicated area and we probably don't have lots of time but really it's about impact factor is looked at um, the net, uh, journals look at them in terms of the amount of citations, how many people are opening the links, uh, the spread of readership. You noticed actually on that um, Indian journal slide that I that that uh, I put up, it actually had a lovely diagram. So a lot of them will put impact factors, right? And um, and what they have done is they've developed a metrics. Now, mathematics is not my area. I actually failed mathematics. Uh, but what they do is they work out a score using a particular formula. I, you know, unless you're in a university, unless you're in a university that uh, you need reports around impact factor, I wouldn't bother about it. That's different, by the way, for those folks that are in the UK, that's different from impact in ref, okay? 
So we have a research excellence framework in the UK. That's about the impact of your work. That's different from the impact of the journal, right? We're talking about two different things. The problem is they're bloody using the same words, impact, 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 right? So it's really an issue, as I said to you in Australia, when I was there, I had to count how many people were citing my work. And you know, there's politics of indexes. If you are interested in this, there's a free piece of software you can download. It's called Publish or Perish. Write it down, no jokes, folk. Publish or Perish. It's a, um, a piece of software where you can put in your details and it will kind of uh, suck in all the people that have published you, uh, have cited your work. The problem is like with me, it doesn't include things like book chapters and stuff like that. Yeah, so, um, and there are other things. Um, Scopus, people will say Scopus is good, but I find it's actually very anti non-Western. It, will, it, won't, it won't pick up small journals. It won't pick up obscure journals. It definitely won't pick up stuff in other languages as well. Um, you know, Camilla is here today. We had a discussion about this. There are impact databases, like if you're doing stuff in Portuguese and Spanish. Um, so these kind of like Western English speaking journals are not so great for, for radical, non-typical journals. Um, and definitely for, for those of you who um, uh, are writing like through Sage India. Uh, Jesse's asked um, what, you can talk to me. Some of you are too scared to do. What role do my PhD supervisor have in my materials for journal publishing? That's something you negotiate with your supervisors. You know what I mean? Like I think uh, you, to get advice, get them to read it. You know, uh, I think that's quite good. I, 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 as I said to you, I think in the sciences, and I think somebody put something about sciences. Uh, yeah, lots of explosive preprints, someone's saying. So no, I'll get back to the topic. It really depends. Some of you have, like, if it's such a hierarchical relationship, like, you know, and I know this happens, and don't get me wrong, because I come from Sri Lanka myself, um, you know, it's like the kind of, you know, the professor's like the Bhagwan in heaven, my God, you know, you carry their briefcases, it's so damn hierarchical. And in some systems, I just spoke to a person to, uh, a couple of days ago who did their PhD in India, they didn't even pick the topic. The PhD supervisor assigned the topic and said, here, do this. And it wasn't even something they were interested in, but they did it because you don't answer back, yeah? So I think it depends on the environment. I would ask other people, you know, um, there's nothing to, to, to stop you. Um, join a research uh, network, which is global like peripheries um, uh, that I'm associated with, if you're interested in that. Um, send me an email. Uh, I think there are other people who can support you. It can become difficult, particularly if you have a supervisor that is controlling. Okay, but my first response is talk to them, ask them. Let's assume goodwill. Um, hopefully, they can give you some ideas because remember, uh, you know, remember we, um, uh, you, you might want to find about them from them what's best in the field. Camilla, can you want to, you have a question about authorship? Yeah. Yes, please, Fiona. First of all, thank you very much for this session. I think that was really good, a great opportunity to talk about the topic and I'm glad to take part. Thank you. Can I just ask before you go, now it's 11.29, are we happy to go for another 10 minutes? People happy? I am recording it anyway, mm -hmm. just so we can get in the times. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Okay, go for it, Camilla. Yeah, Fiona, uh, Professor Fiona, I was having some discussions with some colleagues in Brazil about authorship and about the order of the authors when you publish with your supervisor. So the discussion was if you if you are publishing with your supervisor and he was the supervisor of the work, for example, one of the papers of the thesis, they were talking about the position because your name, well, the name of the students will be the first name. And where should be the supervisor's name? If it should be the second name or if it should be the last name, if you will have other co-authors in the middle. I don't know if this changes country to country, but they didn't have, uh, they were in, they had their ideas as well about what it was, but we didn't find any guideline that would say specifically what. Well, yeah, I mean, look, it's a good question, Camilla. I mean, the first question I would ask you is who did the writing? You know, well, who, 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 who did most of the writing? No, for the PhD student, but then it was the idea where should be the supervisor's position. The, the PhD student is the first one point because it was the paper from the PhD student. And then where should be the supervisor in the second, as the second name? Okay, okay, well, uh, yeah. Name. Okay, well, what, just tell me, um, obviously without giving out details, uh, what did the supervisor actually do in this article? 
No, the supervisor helped with the, the creation of the methodology, helped with right. the discussion of the data, and helped reading all the paper and the final version. It was a big contribution. Okay, okay. So that's the thing. So what some people do, firstly, is they, they, they don't look at the author's order. They first look at uh, apportioning percentages of contribution. Okay, mm -hmm. so it becomes a mathematical exercise. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, an important thing to happen. I mean, it's terrible that it's reduced to that, but this is our labour. It's intellectual labour. So I think um, that's why I asked you, because like, for example, if there's concept development, uh, you know, the methodology, and then mm -hmm. they're reviewing for quality control, that's quite a substantial contribution. Mm -hmm. But how that would equate mathematically, I'm not sure, and that because I don't know, and I don't need to know at this stage in the discussion, but it, that would determine where they, they fit along. The other thing is, so, so that's, that's, that would, so I would look at that, look at the labour, quantifying the labour, you might get some debates, but you know, it's a bit of give and take with this. Mm -hmm. um, and that would, I think, would determine the authorship author order. But the other thing is sometimes um, there is a, another issue that comes into this. And like, for example, in my stage, yes, I have to keep publishing. There's no question about it. You know, I'd be in trouble, but I don't have the pressure because people like come to me for articles. Um, and, you know, I have publishers, you know, wanting me to publish. So, uh, so, so I don't have that kind of urgency so actually in that situation sometimes a PhD supervisor at a goodwill may say look you know either leave me off it or put me on the end or whatever you know what I mean so okay. so just go back to the mathematics Kashala you had a question thanks thank Camilla you. thank you very much Fiona Kashala yeah uh, I have a few questions and uh, uh -huh. uh, following up on uh, Tarin's questions a uh, question about preprint um, like uh, if we uh, put a paper as a working paper and if it's on already online and people start like quoting from like citing from it and so on but if the if the paper does not get accepted to the particular journal uh, after the peer review then can we still publish the paper in a different paper can we send it to another paper like sorry journal and publish that's the first question. And the second question is also a little similar. Like uh, if we have already published a paper in a magazine or like a not a peer reviewed journal, and then if we decide to go for like, like improve it and publish it on a peer review journal with a better impact factor, is it? Is yeah, it I get the gist. Uh, like duplicate um, and uh, the uh, third question is... Oh my God, you're taxing my memory. Uh, Go on. Other questions. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I, I sometimes get these um, uh, emails from different uh, like people who claim to be journals. They say, okay, oh, we yeah. <laughs> research gate or academia or somewhere. And do you have some other paper? So we, will, we would like to publish this paper on our journal. How do we identify the fraud uh, okay. 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 Let's do the let's do the third question first because it's the easiest. I've put up um, a link on the PowerPoint slides to um, a number of sites. Go and check them. Uh, but that, that's not comprehensive, right? So uh, ask around. Uh, speak to your supervisor or other people to find out about this. Uh, usually what these people do is they send bulk emails at a time to uh, academics and PhD students in the school, usually on the same day. They're stupid, really. Uh, that's the best, the best uh, thing. So ask. But those, I, th I did put up those two links, so have a look at that. Um, they keep changing their names. I mean, this is like a, you know, scamming. Um, okay, get the first one about the preprint. I think it's good. I know your article's on SSRN. I think it's good putting stuff out. People will cite it, um, even though you're calling it a working paper. Uh, they, uh, like with the SSRN, they give you an address, um, web address, and the title. Make sure the working paper's in the title, yeah? So it, you know which version. Um, I mean, I put stuff up on academia, EDU, um, and I will actually say, please don't publish without getting permission. So in fact, people write to me to to get permission because the thing about draft papers is you, you you will be fixing it up and you'll have the ability to change your mind. You might even cut things out, yeah? The, the second part of that first question, you actually got four questions in there. Uh, that, so it was about if, if it was rejected, can you go elsewhere? Absolutely. I mean, this is the thing. And the, the frustrating thing about this is sometimes that's why you've got to pick your journal well because you could be waiting, seriously folks, up to eight months. I've even heard, horror stories of longer so it's you can't submit it elsewhere until you've got the rejection 
right? Because the first thing the journal will ask you is, have you submitted this elsewhere, right? And if you say yes, bye-bye. Uh, you, you, you have to get the rejection, right? Then you can submit it elsewhere. But to avoid this terrible thing that going on and on and on, try and get as much as you can. Firstly, try and get an improved manuscript, but journal selection. Uh, the final one was on, now what was it on? It was something to do with publishers. Uh, if it was pre-published somewhere and can Ah, you yes, thank you. You've got that. Okay, so this is the issue. And um, I should disclose, folks, um, Karshala is actually my PhD student. So we've had these discussions, probably for full disclosure, Karshala. Um, so what happens is uh, is often because people don't know about this peer review and, and they submit all these publications, particularly when they're applying for a PhD or elsewhere. Actually, I mean, it's a terrible situation, but those publications are actually worth, not, worth nothing, right? I mean... They're kind of there. When, when you, particularly for scholarships, you have to have peer-reviewed publications, right? But it doesn't mean they're a waste. So the, the, the short answer is, um, yes, you can. I, not as identical, right? I think what it does provide you with an opportunity, because actually you are writing under different circumstances, is to, is to get the original draft. Uh, it will probably have to be longer anyway, because the chances are non-peer-reviewed publications tend to be shorter right, and less scholarly. Not always, but um, so it's an opportunity to rewrite parts of it, right, and put it through the peer review process. Just make sure you pick a different title. That's always a good thing to do. Um, so I think it's, again, if you're unsure, speak to a supervisor or a colleague, um, because we're trying to develop ethical practice here. But it's about, I mean, the thing is, there's a temptation there, because actually, the people who want to read your work often read magazines or short journals. And if you're in a country where there's not a tradition of peer review, people don't really know any different. Right, so, so, and, and, but you don't want that work to go to waste. So hopefully that's clearer. No more questions from you. <laughs> Any, uh, look, we'll go for another five minutes or so, because I know some of you have other, other commitments. So, um, any other questions, anything you can ask, uh, you know, about, um, um, uh, that you'd like to know. Yes. Padmini. I promise to keep this short. I know the review, uh, the editorial boards are always looking for reviewers. What is the most intelligent but not intrusive way, not to look desperate, but to ask people or offer your uh, expertise? I mean, I am a minority. I'm a super, super, super minority in the spaces where I write. So I just don't want to look like I am a line pusher, but I also want to respectfully ask for a spot in the future. Yeah, I think I think that's a great question. The first thing is, like you know, as I say to people, please don't write in a way it's pardon me for believing, for for, for breathing approach. You know that kind of thing of like, you know, if you would be willing kind of thing. It's very submissive. I think you need to say, mm -hmm. I think you need to write in a very strong affirmative style. I, you know, I am writing to you because I have expertise in X, Y, and Z. Um, uh -huh. You know, um, I believe I can make a contribution to this journal as a reviewer. Could you let me know about what the process is for applying to be a reviewer for your journal? Nice and okay. short, and that's it, you know, because, uh, I mean, they, people are looking for gaps. Um, I think we actually, as a political project, we need more people from diverse background. We need, you know, people from ethnic minorities. We need disabled people. We need people for writing about kind of social stratification. Uh, we need those people. Um, and certainly I was talking to a group last night. We, I mean, all of you are involved in this process, um, but we need more people like you to be the authors instead of um, people outside our groups talking about us. Um, thank, so thank you for that. That's okay. And I would really, seriously, folks, I would really encourage it because I said, not only does it look good on your CV, you really get, because you're, when you're reading journals, you're seeing what's come in, what's been accepted, right? You don't see, <laughs> you don't see the myriad of mistakes. And because it's anonymous, you've got no idea whether the person's a, a professor or whether they're somebody kind of uh, as an independent scholar. Now, that's not a put down, by the way, that's a continuum. Um, and it's, you can, as I said in the PowerPoint, sometimes you can work out who these folk are, but, but the fact is you're not meant to know. So actually you can say what you want. And I have seen the most appalling research by so-called high hitting academics, right? So it's great. Look at the mistakes. By reflecting upon someone else's work, you will learn to write better 
yourself. You know, so I really encourage it. Uh, so paid for writing. Uh, yes, Jesse, you asked about that. Jesse, I, it's it's not an area I know lots about. I some people are some journals. You are paid for making a contribution. Right? We're talking about academic journals here, not necessarily. Uh, com and 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 that's distinct from the idea of what we call commissioned work. Okay, commissions work might be uh, sometimes it might be a quarterly that has like essays. Essays are usually about like twelve thousand words, right? And you're paid. Uh, lucky those people. I've never been paid. Uh, to your commission, they come to you. you. You don't submit anything. They say, "Hey, we want you because you're famous or whatever." Um, we want you to write this 12,000 word and they will pay you, right? That's commissioned research, right? And often journalists do that, right? I've, I, I, have, uh, I have written a 12,000 word essay, so I have done that, but no one's ever paid me for doing it. Uh, um, so, uh, but with these other ones, you just got to check what, what they're paying you for and what the conditions of payment. All I'm saying is, you know, have that little crap detector, that kind of suspicious antenna come up if they are asking for payment, check out the journal. Uh, request, saying that they're going to pay you is not in and of itself a indication that the journal is predatory. I want to make that clear. But lots of predatory journals offer payment. Do you see the difference? So that's great. Yeah. So I know some of you have to go, so we're recording things. So I might just take one more question because um, we've gone over time. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I think another option for publication is uh, is is a conference paper, and also my my question is uh, sometimes we we submit a conference paper is from our research. Yeah, that's uh, submitted to a, a formal journal, yeah. but I am not sure uh, whether or not they have they have conflict or impact. Okay. Like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually a really good question. Now, this depends on countries, right? Now, I've only been in the UK for three years. I was really shocked that conference papers were accepted here. Uh, in Australia, they're not. <laughs> okay. Uh, some conference papers, some conferences publish proceedings, right? And they might have an ISBN number, uh, but they're in-house. Uh, they may not even be peer-reviewed, right? This is the problem when you open up. You open up a can of worms. It might be, oh, well, we'll publish your paper if you just send us a copy, right? Some conferences will say, we will publish your proceedings after it's gone, undergone peer review. It's hit and miss, right? Um, the other thing is uh, what happens with some academics, and I know it's not you, Song, because uh, one good thing about PhD students is that you're, you're learning good practice, but sometimes this happens with academics, is that uh, uh, they will publish in conference papers and they'll do conferences all the time because conferences are great, yeah, but they won't ever put it in a journal. My argument to you is, if you think your work's good enough to be in a conference paper, why aren't you submitting it to a journal? You should submit it to a journal. Actually, peer review, um, even though sometimes it can be stressful and you know, you're getting comments back that you may or may not agree with, it actually does strengthen the work. Like even if someone's asking you, why didn't you cover this area? Your very response strengthens, yeah, strengthens the article. So I think it depends. And say in the UK conference papers um, um, are accepted, but I, you need to check. You need to check what the quality and the process is, isn't it? So uh, the other thing is like, is, is, is the conference papers, are they, are they, sometimes they're actually, uh, they're, they're then moved into a book. Okay, that's different again. And sometimes that happens. Uh, sometimes journal, by the way, special issues. Third World Quarterly, which I uh, published in, was a disability issue, right? And it was so successful, that journal um, issue, that they then republished it. We weren't allowed to update it, unfortunately. They republished it into a book. It's all about getting getting your word out. Now, I know that time is, we're way over time now. We left that extra 10 minutes. I just wanted to ask you, um, if would you be interested in another session um, at some stage on uh, book publishing? Is that something that just stick your hand up? Yeah. Good, great. So we might we might organise that. Now you've got you've got my email address. So if you have any follow up questions, uh, yes, how to make a thesis in the book. I'm happy to actually look at those things because that again. And seriously, folks, if anybody sends you an email and you're having a bad hair day, you're feeling depressed, and they say, "Hey, we want to publish your master's thesis or we want to publish your PhD," be very careful because once you send that stuff off, 
it's gone, right? Um, so, uh, you know, so I hope that that's been quite useful, but if you have any other questions, um, you know, just email me and I've got all your emails. So what I'll do is when I organize um, another session, um, I will um, email you, uh, you all. Um, yeah, if someone's asked a question about professional academic blogs. The other thing just separate from that, I probably should run, I used to run another session in the past and I'm happy to run two sessions. One is how to promote your research, how to develop your research profile. So maybe we might make that one as a separate one. Okay, because that's the other thing, particularly is like, how do you get your work out there? I can tell you when I was living in Australia and when I was living in Sri Lanka, it's really hard because people forget you even exist, right? So it's, um, there is kind of like, uh, if you're not with the in crowd, I mean, I, I'll say to you honestly, one of the great things about coming to the UK is uh, actually I don't have to travel far and all the people, your community's nearer and the same in the US. For those of you who are on the peripheries, we need to find out really creative ways that you can promote your research. Look, I'm probably going to wrap up now, and I'm sorry I went a little bit over time, but there's been some good discussions. Um, um, you keep your emails. Just send me an email. And listen, I'm not one of those bug one professors. You don't have to write, Dear Professor Fiona. Just write, Dear Fiona, right? And um, as you can see, I'm a plain talking person. So if you have any questions, uh, just send me an email. Okay, and I'm going to have this recording, and I'll put it up on YouTube, and I'll send you the link to the YouTube uh, if you want to review it. Okay. Have a great day. Thank you very much, Fiona. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.